this first scripture we get from the New Testament, from the book of First Peter. Be reading from chapter five, verses six through eleven. And if you're using a red church Bible, you can find that on page eleven seventy nine. Again, First Peter, chapter five, verses six through eleven, on page eleven seventy nine. And Peter writes, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Uh, second reading comes from uh, Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. But we ought always to thank God for you. Brothers loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us by his grace and gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. So I got my cell phone again. I'll tap on it every so often so I have the, the clock in front of me. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Father, I give you this time and give me uh, spiritual freedom to speak uh, what is on my heart and my mind. I pray that it would be a blessing to your people. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, so first, I want to say I've never found a passage of Scripture that I do not love. And the passage before us is a wonderful passage of Scripture. I just absolutely love it. And um, I have a lot to say this morning before I get to it. First, Arthur, great to see you. Great to see you, Arthur. Yeah, so. All right, um, so what do I want to talk to you about this morning? I want to talk to you about standing firm. Um, standing firm in the faith, and if you take a look at the picture on the back of the bulletin, it's a little bit faded here because it's on a white backdrop, but um, it shows a lighthouse with um, Tremendous waves coming up on it. Now, I don't know if this was, it looked like a real picture when I found it online. I'm not sure if it is or not. Um, but uh, I think it speaks volumes to what I want to say. Now, for those of you who are not physically with us but will watch this message online, or for those of you who don't have a bulletin this morning that are with us, you might want to be able to take a look at it, or maybe somebody will show it next to you. Perhaps we can even put it as a slide into the message. Um, we'll see if that can happen. Uh, but it, it speaks volumes, folks, uh, because I'm going to say to you that a storm is coming. Uh, and that storm, in a sense, is already here. And if you're not spiritually anchored, if you're not spiritually strong and secure in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're not going to be able to weather what's coming. Amen? 
This past week, the election day was a sad day for America. There were eyewitness accounts. Now listen, I don't like to lose, and I, I voted for Donald Trump. I don't like to lose, but I don't mind losing fairly. There were eyewitnesses accounts of many claimed irregularities in this election. From software glitches to dead people voting to people voting in one state when they lived in another. You saw the media already covering ballots that were dumped under rocks in holes. Bags of ballots, according to one postal worker, were received after the closing of the polls, which is illegal. Party observers that were neutral, uh, party observers or neutral observers for ballot counting, were escorted out of buildings so they couldn't observe, or they were kept from going into buildings so they could observe. The ones that they did let in were 150 feet away. So they couldn't really observe. And then you had workers covering up windows so people couldn't even physically look in. You know, I have to say this. When, when somebody wants to hide something, it always reminds me of Genesis Chapter 3, you know, where Adam and Eve hid in the garden. They went off and they scattered like cockroaches. They wanted to hide. If you've got nothing to hide, why are you trying to hide stuff? Now, if you were to listen to mainstream media, and I'm not giving you right-wing talking points. I'm not. Get off the station that you might typically listen to and start doing a little research. The mainstream media doesn't report on it. These are irrational claims and Donald Trump should just concede the election. That wasn't the case four years ago when they claimed that a Democrat won the governorship in, Gen in Georgia, right? Oh, there was widespread uh, 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 you know, election fraud, right? Oh, but this time around, no, there's nothing wrong because, you know, quote, the right side won. Uh, the other thing I want to suggest is, uh, and it's got, gotten even worse, right? Uh, the media has coronated Joe Biden as the next president-elect before legal cases are even being fully addressed. What kind of country do we live in anymore? There are cases at the federal level going, between, uh, going before the Supreme Court level. And they've decided, they've decided this already before these cases are even heard? I mean, even Fox News is on board with it, right? I would suggest to you that it's premature and it's inappropriate. And as citizens, you should be very, very concerned. You can't let people get away with this. But it's part of the big game that's being played. Now I ask you, how can the legal process play out? How does that ever happen now? If you've already coronated somebody to be the president-elect, how does that happen? I want you to remember this. The American media interfered in the election in 2016 more than the Russians did. They didn't find anything on the Russians, did they? And now, even more so, the American media has been complicit. They've interfered in this election again, too. I, I, I want to ask you, how can we send uh, a rover to run around on Mars, 140 million miles away, but we can't figure out elections. We can't 
count ballots and we have to stop everything. Uh, for what reason? To see how many votes you need to get you over the top? You know, um, some people may not like what I'm saying this morning. Some people may not like the political end of it. But you know something? It has to be told. You know, we, sing, we stand here and we sing that God is a God of justice. Is he? You bet he is. And that's what we should expect in our society. And from our politicians. And in our country. How is it that you can put something on Mars 140 million miles away, but you can't have standards when it comes, electronic standards, when it comes to elections? Now, I'll give you my spiritual take on this, but let me tell you, uh, you know, four years ago, I went up and voted, and I went to show my ID. The lady wouldn't even look at it. The other day, I could have went up and I could have voted as Bob Ganaway or Jerry Hartgrove. Are you kidding me? I don't even have to produce a voter ID or a license. But if I get stopped on the side of the road, I have to show the police officer my license? Uh, maybe it wasn't Bob Ganaway. Maybe it could have been Bill Hurley or anybody else who lived in Rainham. I could have voted in place of my son. I've been in this church for 30 years. You know who I am. I don't promote conspiracy theories. I have a biblical worldview that is Christian, traditional, spiritually conservative, and I believe my worldview to be grounded in Holy Scripture. I believe it to be godly. And I believe it to be founded on sound principles. And I believe that if it wasn't, you would have thrown me out a long time ago. I've been consistent and I've been biblical. You're no longer living in the United States of America. You're living in the United States of corruption. The establishment, both the left and the right, <clears throat> have been against Trump and his America First agenda from day one. They tried to cannibalize him four years ago in the media. They spied on his campaign back then illegally. And all that dirt's going to go underneath the rug now. You know that, right? And now they're blatantly stealing the election from half of America. Or at least giving the appearance that they did. And if they were really true blue about it, they would step up and let everything be vetted. So here's my spiritual take. This was not only about being anti-Trump, brothers and sisters. It was, about, it was not only about being anti-American and anti-America first policy. It's about a socialistic and globalistic agenda and Donald Trump was in the way of it. That should be very, very clear to most people who follow the news and follow politics. But it's more than this. It's about an antichrist spirit through and through. And the Apostle John, in 1 John 4, verse 3, spoke about that antichrist spirit that was in the world 2,000 years ago. And it's even more so on the rise today. And we're living in a time, we're living in a time where our government is using its influence and its power in tyrannical ways. We're moving against, moving away from our constitutional freedoms. You know, those freedoms are inalien, inalienable rights given by God, our Creator. 
you know, when they're taken away, we'll, just like, we'll, we'll, wake, up, we'll wake up and say, hey, how did that ever happen? It's kind of like the frog in the kettle, right? Put like a little frog in a, in, a, in a pan of water and it doesn't even know that it's getting boiled after a while. Our government is in bed with high-tech giants like Amazon, Apple, Twitter, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and they control a message. They're controlling the media, electronic media message. The NSA, the National Security Agency, routinely collects everything that you, and you're not an enemy of the state and neither am I, but anything you do on the internet, on your cell phone, your GPS, they're collecting it all. Now you say, Pastor, I don't, you're off the rails here, that's conspiracy. No, it's not. Read the book, it's called No Place to Hide by Glenn Greenwald, and he's a liberal. I'm, re I'm, I'm ready to close. Harold gave it to me months ago. I'm ready to close out. I got about 30 or 40 more pages. It's incredible. Anything you do, they're collecting it. And if they want a composite sketch of what you're like, they'll get it in a couple minutes. Then we have the American mainstream media that carries the water for the government. And that, too, is promoting a socialistic agenda. You see, that's why Donald Trump lost. That's why he got the resistance. I say lost. Lost. So what is my spiritual take in all this? We're living in a time where the spirit of Antichrist is on the rise. The end game is a one-world government. You can read it in Revelation. And it's ultimately about hurting the sheep. That's what it is. Hurting you politically, hurting you socially, hurting you intellectually and economically and morally and spiritually. That's what it is. It's about groupthink and group thought. And it's all got to be one. Uh, we're living in a shame culture. If one disagrees, that'll be used to take them down. We've seen it. We've seen it with celebrities, we've seen it with politicians. We're living in a time where if you express views, political views, Christian views, any kind of view, you're shamed, you're mocked, you're isolated, you're scorned. Or if you wear a MAGA hat, you get beat up maybe, right? That's what it's come to? This is... This is outright thuggery and intimidation. That's what it is. I remember reading a little book years ago, and this isn't even in my notes. It's called How to Kill 11 Million People. And it was about a World War II real situation the church would gather on Sunday mornings and they would worship. And behind this one church, there was a railroad track. And cars and cars of Jews were, uh, uh, railroad cars full of Jews were on their way to not only the concentration camps, but the gas chambers. And all the saints in the building knew what was happening. And, and, and this one saint said, you know, we could hear the train coming. And we would sing louder and louder and louder to drown it out. And he went on to say, and I hear the train coming to this day. Because he couldn't drown it out of his memory. That will be us. If we continue to look the other way. When the CEOs, listen to this, when the CEOs of Twitter, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, uh, who are, uh, the ones I mentioned, when they're able to censor the President of the United States, there's a storm coming. 
And that's why I'm giving this message. And it's not only happening here. Do you know that in Scotland the other week, they passed a law where not only now can the, Scot the Scottish police are allowed to come to your home and remove you if you have six, six people or more in your home. It's actually, if you have more than six people, they can come and remove you because that's against the coronavirus rules and regulations. Well, now they passed a law the other week that they, if you don't have a particular thought, you know, within mainstream, politically, morally, socially, they can come in and remove you from your home. That's Scotland. You know, you go back 400 years ago, the gospel was on fire in Scotland. Scotland was on fire with the gospel. They're known as Scotland's thought police. If Sherlock Holmes were a real person, he'd be rolling in his grave. Of course, he's a fictional character. He's not, right? Uh, by the way, um, the last time I checked, I think Muslim countries have thought police, don't they? Maybe they're coming here real soon, too. Uh, the herding of the sheep is not only happening in America, it's happening on a global scale. There's a bombarding of the airwaves to conform. It's no longer about diversity. It's about uniformity. It's about control, top to bottom. Under the guise of diversity, which they sell you, it's moving to uniformity. And under the government talking points of taking care of you, it's leading to more and more government dependence. And under the guise of promoting safety and protection from bad people, your freedoms are slowly being taken away because they're collecting everything. And that's against the Constitution. I liken this to kind of putting together a jigsaw puzzle. You know, you start out with a jigsaw puzzle. And, uh, you know, sometimes you sit there for a very, very long time, and you can't just figure out any of the pieces, right? Then all of a sudden, you get one piece, and like four or five pieces come. It happens very quickly. And I'm telling you, we're living in a time where it's happening very quickly. We live in a spiritually sick and ever-increasing authoritarian environment. Forget the physical virus. It's being used as a tool to herd people. 99.9% .9 of the people who get the virus are healed from the virus. But you don't hear that, do you? Wait and see if it's not cured in two months or less. I've been saying that for a long time. Just wait. Joe Biden will come up with this magical formula that Donald Trump never used to harness in the government. I would submit to you, be more concerned about the spiritual virus that's among us. That's what you have to be concerned about. The laws of hate speech. Like, for example, you know, if you say that homosexuality is wrong, or you say that something else is wrong, you know, it's hate speech. Encroachments into religious life, you see that with the government, don't you? You saw it especially under Obama's administration. What, 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 what happens with separation of church and state? Oh, it's, it's only separate when it works for the authoritarian people, you see? And when then they don't like what you're doing or they want you to do something, then they encroach. And what about being hostile to Christians and Christianity these days in America? It's there. You know it's there. You haven't seen it much in the last four years under Donald Trump because he's supported religious freedom and liberty. And what happens if you have a politically conservative view? Right? Uh, whatever happened to the First Amendment? Tell me. I do expect, if I'm still in the pastorate, 
I, I do expect to get arrested someday for what I say, what I teach. Just look at how the churches have been treated in California during this lockdown. Oh, you can't meet. You're not allowed to do that. I just watched a video yesterday. This is the Deep South. This is the Bible Belt, right? Nine-year-old Mississippi girl had a mask on that says, Jesus loves me. She was forced to remove it. And yet, in that same school, other people were wearing masks that had political statements and religious statements, at least according to the lawyer, her lawyer. It's amazing. So where am I going with, what's the point here? I'm telling you that we're living during a time where the pieces of the puzzle are coming together very, very quickly. And you need to be aware of it, and you need to stand firm, and you need to be grounded. You know, this is not a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Between four years ago and this year, I can tell you that if you can't see nefarious forces behind thwarting the, wills of, the will of the people, and you've got to be blind. What happened this past week was for a political machine of spiritually rich and powerful people. It's not a government of the people, by the people, for the people. It's globalism, socialism, conformity, uniformity, groupthink. And they're not going to put up with people who resist. They will find a way to destroy you, like they did Donald Trump. Today, destruction is all about character, isn't it? Character assassination. Read Revelation, because when you don't conform, it's off with your head. Especially if one holds to the testimony of Jesus. Now, enough with the politics, right? I wanted this to be an encouraging message. It didn't start out that way, did it? And it hasn't shaped up that way. Uh, there are some great verses to lay hold of here, folks, and I hope it ends uh, encouraging. Uh, before we get to the text, I want to set this passage in its context, because if I don't, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's um, again, it's like, like a diamond in a setting. You've got you to gotta put the diamond in its setting and, so you can display it and, and appreciate it, right? Second, Th Second Thessalonians, the book, is about the day of the Lord, about God coming, and about how God's going to remove the church before he destroys everything in this world. If you take a look at chapter 2 in Thessalonians, verse 1, the church was alarmed and distressed that the day of the Lord had already happened. Now, I want you to imagine this. You're hanging out with some brother and sisters uh, uh, in the faith, right? And you think that the rapture's happened. And it's like, oh my goodness. That's where the church was at. They thought that they were left behind, right? Well, chapter 2 then goes on to talk about the man of sin and lawlessness, the rise of that. That's Antichrist. And then in verse 10, it talks about great spiritual deception in the end times because people did not love the truth enough to receive it. That is the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel. And if verse 11 talks about how God will send them a strong delusion. People be delusional. Peace, peace, safety, everything's happy, everything's going to be good, right? Joe Biden was talking about that last night, wasn't he? Everything's going to be good. This literally, in verse 11, means uh, the, the strong delusion and activity of error. <laughs> oh, man.
man, God's word just splits it, right? I believe that this great deception is happening to this day. It's happening today, folks. People are being herded and they're just buying right into the whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel. And this is what God has laid upon my heart this morning. The Holy Spirit forewarns the church to stand firm and to take hold of the traditions that were given to them. So you don't get caught up in it all and so you can see what's coming. That's why I took a good portion of my time this morning to talk to you politically so you can see what's coming. And I'm telling you folks, God being my witness, I see it coming as clear as day, and it is scary. It's like a bad dream or a nightmare. I don't know if I shared this from the pulpit, but back in August, Drew and I had to drive to New, New Jersey to get a van that we bought for the business. I had to pick up license plates at the Fall River RMV first. And you had to go online and you had to get in an appointment, right? And so I did all that. And we get down there. And as we drive in, the whole area is fenced in, right? And. Uh, there's a cop there, uniformed cop with a sidearm and a bullhorn. And he's telling, stay in your cars. You can't come out. To get, stay in your cars. You're supposed to be in your cars, and we'll call you by your appointment time. And then he, then he would go over to people, and he would start shooing, get back in your cars, get back in your cars. Right? It, it, was, it was bizarre. Totally bizarre, right? So, Drew waits for me in the car, and yours truly had the, um, privilege is not the right word, um, the nightmare of going inside. Cop at the door, one in the parking lot, cop at the door. You get inside, you're socially distanced, six to eight, ten feet away, pole to pole. You're in this dark hallway, hardly lit. You snaked around. Such a sterile environment, right? Um, stern, austere. You finally get to the point where you can see the booth like 50 feet away, right? Ladies behind the glass. And I'm standing there and I'm looking at all this and I'm processing it. I am telling you, brothers and sisters, a spirit of oppression and tyranny came upon me that I am struggling to articulate even to you right now. I go back to that moment and I'm telling you, God being my witness, it was like a spiritual encounter of darkness that's coming. You say, oh, man, this guy's really lost it. Drink some more water. You know, go get some fresh air. Um, you know, don't go to Times Square, Pastor, but go out and get some fresh air. You're losing it. No, I'm not. I'm telling you I am not. Um, I was in there for like about 35 minutes. Get license tags? Are you kidding me? And um, when I came out, Drew says, oh, my goodness, I was wondering what happened to you. <laughs> you know, like as if I was never going to come out again. I'm telling you, I couldn't wait to get out of that environment. It was bad. It was scary. Hard to describe. I want to ask you a question. Do you feel a spirit of tyranny and oppression these days? Yes. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. You can't be yourself. You are shamed into wearing a mask if you have to. Right? Go into a place. Well, 
We're losing our democratic republic. We're losing America. What was founded by, established by the founding fathers, it's gone. And I believe we're on the verge for ma major, major pieces coming together. One world government. Is it two years away? Probably not. Is it 20 years away? May, maybe not even 20. But it's coming. I'm telling you. The pieces are coming together. I would submit to you that the foundation has been laid for this one world government. The house is under construction. The roof and the windows are going in soon. The interior decorating plans are all in place. Tell me, do you not see it? It's had an election stole from 70 million people. Or at least that's the appearance and the impression. Let's vet the votes. What does the Apostle Paul write to the church? Great words of encouragement and comfort and hope. Take a look at verse 13. He thanks God for believers, whether it's in Thessalonica or in Rainham, Massachusetts. Praise God for believers. And praise God that they're beloved of the Lord, they're chosen of God, they're sanctified by the Spirit and faith in Jesus Christ. And they're called of God. And he speaks of the church being glorified someday with Christ. Folks, that put Holy Spirit wind in my sails. I've got a future and a hope. And so do you. Because the American dream's gone. And they're going to take, take more and more away. You talk about encouragement and encouraging things. Take a look at verses 16 and 17. God's love is mentioned again. Eternal comfort. Oh, I can't wait till I get to the place of eternal blessing. Good hope. Grace. Comfort and strength for the heart. I am telling you, we are going to need all of it all of that for what's coming. You're going to need all of it if you are to stand firm. Now, take very quickly a look at verse 15. The Apostle Paul uh, writes here, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from it. What is the Apostle Paul referring to here? He's referring to apostolic teaching. The teachings that the Apostles gave to the early church by word of mouth or by letter. We're talking about Holy Spirit teaching to the church. The Lord Jesus Christ is teaching to the church. And he's, and, and, and he's talking about standing in the truth of the gospel. Uh, word of mouth, letter, lifestyle, doctrine. Verse 14, he called you through the gospel. That's what the Apostle Paul's talking about. Apostolic teaching. You know, we don't hear much about the Apostles' teachings today. It's right here in Scripture. Uh, let me, listen to what one scholar uh, said about this, because I, 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 it's, it's, it's a great, I couldn't say it any better. Um, it comes out of the New American Commentary. He says, quote, The various confessions, hymns, exhortations for Christian households, and ethical instructions, um, including vice and virtue lists, reflect the type of tradition that was circulated in the churches and had been passed on to the Thessalonians. The traditions contained in verses 1 through 14 had to do with eschatology. That's end time stuff. And he finally says, no teaching is totally compartmentalized. And error in one matter often leads to error in another. So let me, let me translate that very, very quickly for you. A certain body of truth was delivered to the church. Jude talks about that in Jude verse 3. And so basically, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the scriptures, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
His appearing to the saints, that's all apostolic teaching. Philippians 2, Christ, being the very form of God, humbled himself and became a man. Philippians 2. Colossians chapter 1, Christ is over everything in the universe, the created world, and the, the, the physical world, the created world, and he's head of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4, it's about living a godly and moral lifestyle. Ephesians 5 and 6, exhortations to the Christian family. That's what he's talking about. Do you know all this stuff has often been dismissed today? I, I heard of a situation more recently where parents were thankful and affirming that their son was homosexual. Christian. Christian. The picture is this. You poke a hole in the dike, punch a hole in the dike, and it starts to erode. So take a look at our society today. Do we have churches that stand on apostolic teaching? I don't think so. Doctrinally, churches are not preaching the gospel. Doctrinally, churches are accepting lifestyles condemned by Scripture. And when sound doctrine is rejected, yet what is, the, what is the church to do? Scripture tells us to stand firm and to hold to God's truth. And if there's great pressure to conform, you stand firm and you still hold to God's truth. And if you're living in a shame culture and they want to shame you, you stand firm who cares if they shame you? You stand firm on apostolic teaching. And when the thought police and the government try to censor you, stand firm on what the Holy Spirit tells you and has taught you and teaches you. This uh, scholar, I'll share one more quote before I close. He says, the church must not be deceived either in the present or in the last days when a great deceiver will come on the scene. They must not be deceived by false prophecy, verse 2, or by false reports, verses 2 and verse 15, or by forged letters, verses 2 and verse 15. A church certain of its future in Christ, verse 16, at peace with itself, and well-established in Christian patterns of belief and behavior is a church that can stand firm in the face of error and opposition. Amen to that. If you're not standing on Christ, the solid rock, and his holy scriptures that are able to make you wise unto salvation, you're going to get washed away, sucked up like a vacuum cleaner. I close with the Apostle Paul's prayer in verses 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort by good hope and grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for these scriptures. May they bless and grace and encourage our hearts. May your Holy Spirit continue to uh, be our teacher and our guide. May this church stand on the scriptures and what the apostles taught through the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, may, this, uh, may the people that come here Stand firm. May the people that are here be firm and stand and rest in you. We do thank you uh, for this time. 
We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Folks, our closing hymn, number 730, 730. Stand up, stand up for Jesus.